Hello, everybody. Um, wow, it's, it's working well today. Uh, we had the perfect storm of tacos in the buffet and a talk about the local economy. So sorry about the, the, the timing of everything. Uh, but we're going to get started now. Uh, maybe you thought you were done with me. You're almost there. Uh, my name is Brett Rosenberg. I am the outgoing chair of the board of City Club Missoula. And I just want to express my gratitude for the, the two years I've had for uh, this opportunity, and also my gratitude to uh, hand over the reins to Julie Maloney, our incoming chair, who will introduce this forum. So I will give it to her, and she will get things going right now. Um, again, thank you, everybody, so much for your support and uh, for coming today. It's really great to see you. Good morning and welcome everyone. As Brett said, I'm Julie Maloney. I'm with Payne West Insurance and now I'm the chair of the City Club of Missoula. I'm so happy to see so many of you here with us today. It's fantastic, thank you for coming. Our mission is to bring people together to inform and inspire them on issues vital to the community through public forums that encourage the discussion of new ideas and the free exchange of thought. We have a deep commitment to civility and civil discourse even when we discuss challenging issues. Before introductions, some thank yous. <clears throat> Thanks to Missoula Community Access Television, which records our forums as part of the media assistance grants to nonprofit organizations. MCAS serves our community on cable channels 189 and 190. MCAT occasionally live streams our forums on its local live platform as well. You can find videos, excuse me, <laughs> of past CCM forums by clicking the video button on our website, cityclubmissoula.com. Thanks to our sponsors, in particular those at the executive level, they're the University of Montana, Blackfoot Communications, and First Security Bank. Our executive level sponsors are key partners in keeping to expand audience access and reliably planning and conducting our forums. <clears throat> we are grateful to all of our sponsors, and we invite you to join them by going to our website. And of course, thanks to our board of directors and our minister, Danny Hallett. City Club Missoula would also like to acknowledge that we are in the aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. Today, we honor the path they have always shown us in caring for this place for the generations to come. Now for our panel. Our moderator for today's panel is Justin Engel. Justin is Associate Professor of Marketing and the Poe Family Distinguished Faculty Fellow at UM's College of Business. He earned his PhD and MBA from the Michael G. Foster School of Business at the University of Washington and did his undergraduate studies at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Justin's academic research focuses on the unconscious effects of social and marketing factors on attitude and behavior. His research has been published in the Journal of Marketing, Journal of Consumer Research, and Journal of Consumer Psychology, and covered by media outlets such as Sports Illustrated, ESPN, The Washington Post, Harvard Business Review, and The Wall Street Journal. Justin is also creator and host of the College of Business podcast and Montana Public Radio program, A New Angle. In 2021, he released Fireline, a six-part podcast about wildfire that won an Edward R. Moreau Award. Prior to his doctoral studies, Justin worked as a bond trader with a specialty in hedging interest rate risk for mortgage banks. After leading the trading floor, he worked as a collegiate rowing coach at both the University of Pennsylvania and Yale University. When not, te not teaching, doing research, or chasing his two daughters, Justin is a competitive endurance athlete and product tester for Patagonia. Justin will introduce our panelists and I will see you all at the break, roughly 12.20, 12.25, at which point we will begin table talk, which I'll explain later, and then open the forum to questions from the audience. Over to you, Justin. Thanks, Julie. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. It's an honor to be here with you and with these uh, two amazing economists we'll learn about here in a moment. Um, welcome to City Club Missoula for January, our first event of the year. We're joined today by two amazing economists. Not only are these two outstanding at making sense of a wide variety of economic data, they are exceptional at communicating what all that data means for the rest of us. Bryce Ward is the founder of ABMJ Consulting. 
He is an applied microeconomist with broad expertise, including healthcare, education, labor, housing, and social capital. He earned his PhD from Harvard University, and this year he is the keynote speaker on the Montana Outlook Economic Outlook Seminar, presented by, uh, presented by the University of Montana's Bureau of Business and Economic Research. Patrick Barkey is the director of the Bureau of Business and Economic Research, a position he's held since 2008. He's been researching and making economic forecasts for over 40 years in both the private and public sectors. Pat is an expert on energy development, tourism, labor markets, tax policy, and international trade. He also hosts the long-running Montana Economic Minute, a daily podcast on economic issues that airs on radio stations throughout the state of Montana. He earned his PhD and BA in economics from the University of Michigan. Fellas, thanks for being here today. Pleasure to be here. So um, we'll start with you, Bryce. We've talked a lot about how the economy is messy and making predictions is difficult, especially ones that deal with the future. Um, when, you talk, when you say messy, you predict that the, the economy will continue to be messy for, for the next little while. What does that mean? What do you mean by messy? So we're, we're in year three of mess. Um, it's been different messes. Uh, so, you know, obviously first we had the COVID direct mess and then we had the COVID induced mess. Mm. Uh, and the COVID induced mess is where we're still trying to get out of. And the COVID induced mess has two parts. So first, <clears throat> we just wreaked havoc on supply chains, right? So, uh, and that's for a result of two things. One is just things got messed up because of COVID. Um, but also as a result of us being at home and not being out in the world, we changed what we wanted to buy. We shifted how much money we spent on services, we reduced that, and we started to buy a lot more goods. So that put a lot of pressure on the goods supply chain uh, because we wanted more of it. So that demand had increased it. <clears throat> and then, you know, we've recovered some in the services side where goods are starting to normalize. We're kind of closer to normal, but we still have that imbalance, right? So that, you know, kind of, was one of the sources of the havoc is just this shift from normal to more goods, less services, uh, and then both of those not being able to meet demand because of havoc. So that's the supply side factors. And at the same time, um, we didn't spend as much money during 2020. Uh, so we saved a bunch, uh, and we also got a bunch more money through various stimulus packages. So all told, households got about two and a half trillion dollars that they saved up uh, that, you know, more than normal. Uh, and, you know, how, household balance sheets remain kind of strong. So that kind of gave us demand side, right? So increase demand, mess up supply, you get inflation. And that's what we've been dealing with for over a year now. And that's the main mess that we're dealing with. Um, good news, we have started to see disinflation. So we're not at the peaks we were a few months ago. It's starting to come down. And it appears like what's baked into the system in terms of things we only see with a lag is likely to keep pushing it down, hopefully. Um, and you know, and a lot of that's because the supply side has kind of fixed itself for the most part. So we're not seeing as much supply side problems, right? So now we have just the demand side, but the demand side stuff is still there. And you know, now we're stuck with the Federal Reserve trying to deflate demand, um, which is very hard, right? The, the metaphor that I use is um, economic policy making is a lot like uh, kid drivers. I thought of this when I took my children golfing for the first time this summer and I watched them on golf carts. Um, and, uh, you know, I had one who was, uh, okay, we're ready to go. And it's immediately gas pedal to the floor and it's, oh, now we need to slow down and it's, I'm gonna slam on the brakes. Um, uh, I had a different one who was, you know, a little better at regulating uh, gas and brake, but had no ability to pay attention to what was going on around them. Um, you know, she almost ran into a tree and I was like, ah, she avoided the tree. She flings it into reverse and nearly hits my dad. Um, and you know, why am I telling you this story? Well, A, it's because I'm using, but B, Jerome Powell is like a kid at a golf cart. Right? You know, we, he may have a giant team of people that are all sitting there saying, hey, we're looking around trying to keep an eye on everything. But the reality is, is that we don't really know where we are with respect to the economy at any given point in time. Right? The data we have is always backward looking. We don't know where exactly we are. And we don't know exactly what the conditions are in the world that we're trying to deal with. And so it's like, we're trying to take our foot off the gas. 
and not have to slam on the brakes without spinning into the ditch. But it's all happening, at, you know, like, kind of like a kid when they're driving a car. It's, it's, they're still processing too much. It's not automatic. And so we don't have automatic kind of ease of motion when it comes to economic policy making. And so the challenge that we still face is, you know, they've raised, the Fed has raised interest rates a ton. Uh, that is certainly deflating demand in certain sectors. Uh, we have no yet in indication that we're in a recession. Um, but there are some indications that, you know, at least some of these kind of early warning indicators that are not always very reliable are kind of flashing red. Like, yeah, the probability of recession at some point in 2023 is maybe elevated. Um, but, you know, I try not to predict the future. Um, it's not really my area. Uh, I'm not very good at it. If I was good at it, I certainly wouldn't be here. I would be off betting on my skills, uh, getting very rich. Um, Pat tries to do more forecasting. He, you know, I think it's literally part of what he thinks of as his job. So uh, I think at this point, maybe we can you know, ask Pat what he wants to say about what the future is. Sure, thanks for that, Bryce. You're giving me a little bit of flashbacks of getting a golf cart stuck on a beach once. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I was about 11, so. There you um, go, there you go. There you go. Don't take golf carts on the beach if you ever want to try, or maybe not the sand traps either. Uh, Pat, let's sort of shift the focus local and talk about um, and maybe how the Missoula economy has changed over the last five or 10 years. We're certainly in a different place now than we were a while back. Sure, Justin. <clears throat> First, I'm kind of struck by the irony of uh, asking three UM guys to tell you anything about the real world. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what the heck? Uh, so uh, Missoula today, so we have to, we have to separate from what Missoula has been through that's different than what everyone else has been through um, because uh, we're quite a bit different today simply because of a lot of things Bryce described as they manifested themselves in our community. So we certainly saw a very pronounced down up cycle uh, that Bryce described. It was um, kinder to some industries than others. Uh, uh, the notable uh, ones that were hurt of course were the uh, human facing industries clearly accommodations, this industry right here, to some, extent, to some extent healthcare. Other industries like construction and tech uh, hardly noticed it at all. So there's been a lot of uh, upheaval. Uh, there's been gigantic labor market strain. Uh, of course, there's been inflation. There's inflation in every community in the country. So that much is, is no different. And uh, it's, 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 it's extremely meaningful just because everyone else is going through it. It's probably top on uh, your concerns as well. Uh, what's happened, what, how is Missoula different? Well, I mean, one thing here, and I have to be a little bit worried because there's, oh, there is a back door. Uh, we're number three. <laughs> we're, we're now the, the third largest economy in the state, and that's really, uh, there's no shame in that because Bozeman's passing everybody. Uh, but they are, uh, they're, they've gotten to be not just a little larger, but pretty significantly larger than Missoula. And uh, we won't talk about how they did that, but, uh, but nonetheless, that's, that's there. Uh, as I look at Missoula over, I don't know, the last five or 10 years, um, first off, in terms of what makes the Missoula economy tick, has changed in ways that I think are, are pretty positive uh, for everything that we're going through. Uh, we, we do have a tech sector in Missoula. Many, many of you are in it. Uh, and as a result of some of the growth in tech, uh, Missoula is picking itself up from being what you might consider to be a very typical low-wage college town to one that pays a more decent wage. Uh, our, our, wage is, our wage growth has been impressive. Uh, and uh, there's a different uh, vibe uh, because of that. Um, I think in terms of uh, other issues though, I think we've gotten a little worse. Um, we, we have a extremely stressed housing market that over five years has gotten worse, uh, mostly because we're not building as much and we have economic growth. And you put those two together and you get rising prices uh, in the case of what happened in 20 and 21, which was highly unusual, a huge spike in housing demand. Uh, you have low inventories. But we, we, we clearly have a housing, uh, housing market strain. 
Um, you know, uh, we stand in good company, I suppose, if you want to say it, put it that way, uh, with a lot of other uh, very livable, very nice to live places that happen to be unaffordable. <laughs> and we're not quite all the way there yet, but we're, we're, but we're, we're making uh, great strides towards that. Uh, we're also a, a city uh, and a community whose tax base is changing as well. Uh, we're less industrial than we used to be. Our tax base is growing more slowly, uh, property tax base is growing more slowly than is our appetite for public services. So as a result, we have higher taxes, which in many cases we vote for. So it's not, you know, that's, that's, that's an outcome and that's, that's a shift and where we are. I think uh, in many ways though, uh, we're, we're um, and this is sort of feeding into what Bryce is gonna talk about at our program, uh, we're, we're becoming a community that is, uh, has more newcomers as well uh, than well, we always have. Uh, we're a college town, we have a, we have a constant churn of people coming and going. But in terms of uh, people selecting us as a place to live, and to do business, uh, perhaps doing business in another state remotely, perhaps doing business here. So I think that is a, uh, that's a subtle change as well. Um, so um, maybe I'll just stop there and, and say that's the view from 30,000 feet. Sure, you know, Bryce, you talked a bit about Jerome Powell and his golf cart. I'm coming back to the golf cart quite a All bit. Right. Um, so when we talk about this imprecise tool that the Fed has, interest rates being the most salient, when, it, when an interest rate rise occurs, particularly at the rate at which these series of rate hikes have occurred, what, is, what how does that translate down to you know the folks sitting in this room and, and the, the work that they're trying to do here in the local economy? Well, the easiest one to get your head around is just interest rates for mortgages. Right. Um, and so if you looked and you said, okay, um, so housing prices in Missoula have gone up a lot. Right, so just since uh, the fourth quarter of 2019, not adjusted for inflation or anything, they're up like 65%. Um, now that's a really scary number. But then you go, okay, well, we, we had a lot of inflation, so adjust it for inflation, and you get down to more like, you know, 30 something percent or 40 some percent. Um, and then for a long of that period, right, you know, through the end of 2021, interest rates were bargain basement. So if you just said, hey, look, what does it cost to go buy uh, the average house with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage? What's my payment going to be? And, you know, the payment as of the end of 2021, when a lot of this housing appreciation had gone, was still completely normal within the range that, you know, we had seen in Missoula going back to the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, and we looked at it as a share of income. It was actually less than you paid in 1990. Uh, then the interest rate spike happens, right? And now if you look at that payment... Right, I think it's gone up over 40 some percent in less than a year. It is now, I mean, the, the, the highest it had been, had been in like 2004, five, six, seven, right? So the peak of the housing bubble. Mm -hmm. And you know, we kind of, hey, if you looked at, I don't have the graph here, but you kind of looked at it when I was like this, you know, a little, little bit of a wave. And most of the 2010s it had kind of been really cheap and kind of ticked up a little bit in 2021. And now it's vertical, right? It is so far, it's like, you know, if you just kind of, this is a rough measure because I don't have like a good measure of, of, of household income. But if you just say, well, what does it cost to, for that 30 year mortgage payment on an average house uh, as a share of personal income per capita, which isn't household income, but you know, just average personal income. Um, you know, it's like over 40%, right? And then historically it had been in the 20s. And so we've seen just an enormous change in the affordability of housing. And so that's what it means day to day, you know? So if you want, you know, we lived in a low interest rate environment. So if you're just an I's age or younger, um, you don't remember inflation because it really wasn't part of our lives. And, you know, I wasn't paying much attention to interest rates before, you know, the mid 2000s. Um, and, you know, every, my, my parents, when I bought my first house at like a 6% mortgage rate, were like, that's amazing, it's just so great. All right, and then they haven't been 6%, you know, in. 15 years, right? Like maybe one period, but you know, so it's, it's just a big change, but it's not just, interest rates are a really powerful lever in the economy, right? They affect all sorts of things like the stock market and uh, the viability of various venture capital funded businesses and you know, all sorts of stuff. And so, you know, moving into a higher interest rate environment, the idea is, is that, you know, we're gonna destroy demand 
right? That's the whole point. And the downside of that is if we don't get it right, if we crash into a ditch, we end up destroying capacity, right? We wanna stop utilizing stuff so extensively. That's where inflation comes from. But if we crash, we end up in a recession, well, then we have to, just, we end up destroying capacity that we have to rebuild, right? So that's the danger that we're facing. But, you know, the reality of high interest rates, the easiest one, obviously, is what it's doing to, you know, the price of purchased housing and then what that does to then construction. So we did build a lot. In 2021, building permits in Missoula County were like twice normal, right? I mean, it was a lot. And in 2022, they were still high, but they fell almost by 60 some percent, right? And, you know, that's, and interest rates were, have been ticking up. I am not optimistic about 2023, but given that, as Pat talked about, you know, here's my little preview fact. If you want to come check out the BBR Outlook tour, um, net migration to Montana is three and a half times higher in the last two years than it has been over the last 20 years. Now, Missoula, because we don't have housing, hasn't been capturing that as much of that. Um, you know, it's, it's in Ravalli and Mineral and Sanders and Granite and Lake. Um, Missoula is kind of just a little bit of normal, but that's not because there wasn't demand. Housing prices went up by a lot. It's that there wasn't supply. You, there was no place to put them. Um, but, you know, so that demand, that has to do with a fundamental shift in the economy about remote work and some of those things. That's probably not going to go anywhere, or at least will be much higher than it was pre-pandemic. Uh, so not building housing just means that we were prolonging a problem. Or at least we have to decide how much housing we want to build. But you know, the fact that interest rates are making it harder for us to deal with our capacity issue uh, is not a great thing. It just means that we're going to kind of be in this mess for a little bit longer. Sure, Pat. But continuing on with interest rates, I mean, you, you mentioned the, some of the shifts in the economy. We kind of have a, a newcomer effect, and you know, the rise of the tech sector and decline of manufacturing. Yeah. When you think about the effects of interest rates on a local economy, are we more or less exposed to interest rate shocks now based on these changes that you described, or, or is that not something that we should be thinking about? I, I don't think we're especially as exposed to high interest rates here. I think uh, uh, that doesn't mean they're not painful, as Bryce described. I think uh, there's two aspects to the interest rates, of course. Interest rate is just a price. It's a price of money. So in any case, there's a transaction, there's a buyer and there's a seller. So that joyous time Bryce just described uh, when he was borrowing money was completely painful. It punished savers. And it forced savers to go to all kinds of lengths hmm. to come up with some kind of return so they could fund the things that they wanted to fund in their future. So uh, there are two sides to that. But in terms of the, the short run look, at uh, how our economy does. Um, one of the things that has emerged as an important part of the Missoula economy in the last couple of years has been construction. And, uh, and construction now is, is more, um, uh, it's represented more heavily in the Missoula economy than it has been for quite some time. And uh, that is a very interest rate sensitive sector. Mm -hmm. um, but no one in the construction industry should be surprised to see demand go up and down. I mean, it's just not that kind of industry. So, uh, and, and every uh, community has construction to some degree or another. I think the key, uh, the key for interest rates is not uh, regionally, how do we stack up against Billings, against Boise or whatever versus interest rates, but rather what does it mean for our short-term future? And Bryce is exactly right. It's, it's a higher price to do some of the things that you may want to do. And so those things will either not be done, they'll be done on a smaller scale, or they'll be done later. And all of those things have the effect of cooling off uh, the demand, and which is exactly what the Federal Reserve is trying to do. So uh, I think uh, the thing about interest rates, though, that is I'd like to keep in mind is that they are also a what economists call a nominal measure. So, you know, yeah, it's true that the mortgage rates are over 7%, but you know what? Inflation, at least year over year, I agree with Bryce, it's, it, is, it is coming back down to earth, but year over year, inflation is running not too far from that number. So in terms of the value of the money you have to use to pay off your loan, uh, interest rates are actually, in, in that inflation corrected sense, not as high. Clearly they matter, but, uh, you have to keep in mind some of these some of these numbers in the economy, 
in the higher inflation environment we're in now, your wage rise, your price increase, or your interest rate doesn't mean the same thing when you when you when you recompute it uh, with inflation taken into account. Hmm. So, getting a little bit more specific, thinking about. You know, if, if Missoula is well known for its entrepreneurial spirit, entrepreneurship community. Is this, Pat, is this a good time to be an entrepreneur trying to start a business or, or a tough time? And how would you describe that? This is funny because Bryce is the expert on entrepreneurship and you're asking me that question. <laughs> I know. And then you asked him the Fed question. That's I right. like that. I, I like, like that. we've totally inverted This is here. good. This is like, like flip the deck. Um, you know, uh, so I'll tread water here for just a second. <laughs> Um, it's always a good time to be an entrepreneur. I mean, that's uh, the ironic thing is that the rate of entrepreneurship is actually falling. We're turning into an economy that is more dominated by mid to large sized employers. Uh, I'm not sure if that's happening in Missoula to the same degree. Um, but entrepreneurship, uh, I, I think it, it, it happens in, in, in two ways. Uh, one is what I guess I would consider to be uh, uh, your passion is entrepreneurship. You have the resources to pursue your dream. Uh, you start business. The other one is you lose your job. <laughs> and right now, the one asterisk on every concern for the economy in 2023 is the job market. Because right up to the very most recent report, we're hearing that US employers and to a large degree Montana employers are continuing to hire. So. I noticed there was economic security with a question mark here. Oh, that hasn't been threatened too much. Mm -hmm. So that, that force for creating new entrepreneurs is not there in the economy right now. Bryce, any thoughts on, you know, in, 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 in an economy where it's harder to get access to capital, presumably it would make you, make your business better, right? If you're trying to go out and raise capital, you just have to have a better pitch. You gotta have a tighter, kind of idea and have that idea, you know, fleshed out further along. What do you, what do you think about in that? In theory, um, you know, we saw a lot of really dumb ideas, yeah. uh, you know, in a low interest rate environment, um, you know, so maybe, uh, you know, but, I mean, you know, it, it, entrepreneurship, you know, there's, it's a multi, there's, there's several factors, right? Mm -hmm. So interest rates are just one of several, right? You know, there actually has been a boom in entrepreneurship during the pandemic. Um, and that's because of this massive shift in the location of economic activity, right? You know, the fact that people are reshuffling where they want to spend their time means that there's now opportunities, right? And there's opportunity, and, you know, and the way the business is organized is different. So there's just different, there, you know, so, you know, it's always a function of how big is the opportunity and what is the cost to pull it off, right? So the cost of pulling it off in a low interest rate environment, you know, as Pat said, like, you know, those people with money that are trying to find return, you know, you start grasping at straws to some degree, right? You know, like that's what venture capital really is exceptional at, right? It's like, well, look, we're going to pool our money and we're going to bet on a hundred things and hope that one of them pays off, yeah. right? And that will generate, a, you know, and a payoff in this huge fashion, which will generate enough return to pay off for the 199 other bad bets, right? Now with higher interest rates, yeah, you know, I don't have to pursue that as much, but, you know, I also am sitting there saying, well, now there's opportunities. And so those opportunities, you know, it, it's just market clearing, right? Prices move, markets clear. Uh, what does it mean for Missoula? I don't know. I mean, certainly it means, you know, the shift in the location of activity as of thus far, Missoula and Montana are winners, right? Winner, well, if you view more people as winning, um, you know, that's a debate um, and a big one and it's gonna be a bigger part of the debates in the future in Montana. but. Uh, you know, it, we are certainly on the attractive end in terms of uh, where the shifts in economic activity are occurring. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that creates opportunities, um, but it also is going to create a bunch of fights. How are we feeling about infrastructure based on the growth of this community and other areas around Montana, transportation infrastructure, healthcare, and so forth? You know, have we been able to, we talked about how Housing supply has not kept up with the population growth. Are, are, are there systems to accommodate a boom in population keeping up with, uh, with the rate of population growth, or are they doing a better job than the housing market? Well, I'm, I'm tempted to quote uh, from Bryce's old advisor on infrastructure. I love it. That's one of my favorite uh, Glazer quotes is that uh, 
there's uh, there's opportunity to make really big mistakes in infrastructure investments. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to never forget that. You know, I mean, uh, I, I can't help editorializing here a little bit. This has not too much to do with Missoula per se, but the way we build and fund infrastructure is is kind of screwy in this country, to put it mildly. Um, you know, it's 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 a political thing. Uh, we don't pay for it very well. I'm an economist. I mean, things should not be free. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, and yet that's the way we pay for infrastructure. So I I, I don't want to go off on that tangent for sure. too long because it becomes a bit of a sermon. <laughs> but uh, it is um, it is is difficult to imagine in the world we're in now that infrastructure would keep up. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Um, so infrastructure is also lumpy and difficult to pay for. Uh, not, only is it, not only is it difficult to find the people who should pay for it, but it's difficult to uh, assign what each one should pay. So uh, it, um, I, I don't think the, the growth in Missoula is to the point where our infrastructure needs, in terms of public infrastructure, are a, uh, are a huge concern. Uh, our, our, our water systems, our, uh, our, our, um, our other public services are, are functioning. You mentioned housing, so we'll leave that one off the table. That one does have some, some real issues with it. But uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm treading water a little bit with this question because I, I, I really, I don't like the way we pay for infrastructure. And, and, and so until we do fix it, I don't expect to see a very responsive uh, infrastructure investment to uh, to accommodate changes in growth. Sure, Bryce, you have any thoughts to add on that? Well, look, I mean, this is simple demand and supply, right? Demand for Missoula, demand for Montana have gone up, right? That means you know we're seeing that both in more people, different people, and higher prices. So that means that we have to decide how much we want to increase the supply of Montana to accommodate that demand, and. There's all sorts of different approaches to how much we increase supply, right? You know, California famously has made it essentially impossible to build very much. Right. And as a result, price goes up, people leave, not more quantity. That's essentially the, what we are going to be facing in Montana. We already have. We've already been facing this. But as demand shifts out and as it shifts out in a much larger way, we have to now decide, okay, well, what are we going to do on supply? And that means we have to decide how we want to pay for it. That means we have to decide where we're going to put it. Means we have to decide how much of it we're going to make. Um, and those are all very big, contentious fights, right? And then we also have to recognize that some of our infrastructure is not built infrastructure. That's physical capital. But some of our natural capital, um, we can't increase the supply of it, right? So, you know, there's always going to be these fights about scarcity, that's what growing demand does, you know, look, it's better than the alternative, right? You know, shrinking demand, uh, when you're watching things decay and you're in the downward loop, that's, the, that's, the, that's really where you don't wanna be. But in the world of increasing demand, the fights are about the fact that some things become more, quote, scarce because demand is, you know, supply has to keep up with demand. And the good news is, is that we have some control over how we manage supply. Sure. Um, the bad news is, is that it's not clear that the recent historical record suggests that we're very good at that. Super. I think, Julie, correct me if I'm wrong, but given the size of the crowd here today, we're going to move to table talk a little bit early so we can make sure that each table can get a question aired. Is that right? Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, so table talk is a very rich part of the City Club Forum and is arguably the gist of why we're here. We will take about 10 minutes for each table to come up with a question related to the presentations to ask the panel. Somebody with a mic will come around afterward for a volunteer from each table to ask the agreed upon question. As I said in the beginning, we are committed to civil discourse. So we ask that you keep your questions respectful in one question and that you avoid making statements. We also ask that any members of the media save their questions until after the forum. So, have fun talking. Good afternoon. 
So the, the question our table has is regarding what the Federal Reserve looks at when they're looking to raise rates. So typically they look at the job market to see how the job market is reacting. Why do they continue to look at that what is typically a lagging indicator instead of looking at commodities when adjusting rates? So if the job market in December was still fairly decent, meaning the Fed may increase rates again in January, which could push us closer to a recession. Am I allowed to answer a Fed question? You're the Fed guy. Then. <clears throat> I'll, I'll make a little quick remark. Okay, so there are, at last count, I think over 1,400 PhD economists that work for the Federal Reserve System. So they look at a lot of things. Um, what they used to look at were their models. And their models were pretty good, but the world changed. And so their models told them uh, that the, uh, uh, the, the three stimulus bills that were passed would, would not provoke serious inflation, or if it did, it would be that dreaded word, transitory inflation, yet it did. So f right now, the Federal Reserve is being more judgmental. And um, they are not without controversy in terms of what they're doing. All right, but they are looking at the job market because of the wage pressure, because uh, that is, uh, at least in my mind, the biggest threat to sustained inflation, uh, which is much higher than any of us are comfortable with, is coming from the labor market. And the continued strong hiring in the labor market is a force for that. There are many, many stories that go with that, whether you want to talk about the, the settlement of the railroad strike, what's going on with airline pay, et cetera. But that's, that's why they're looking at it, and that's why they're worried about it. In terms of commodity prices, it has been a bit of a red herring for Federal Reserve. Uh, and I would, I would add to that uh, equity prices as well, uh, because the Federal Reserve is a pretty slow-moving institution. Think about what the Federal Reserve does. They write down a number on a post-it note and they thumbtack it to the wall. And that's the, that's the rate. That's what they do. Of course, they do more than that, I know. But uh, that's, that's the most visible thing they do. And, uh, and so the idea of the, that kind of policy chasing commodity prices up and down with wars and everything else is, is just, it's, I wouldn't say it's hopeless, but it's pretty difficult. So at our table, we spent a lot of time talking about the housing market and a little bit about short-term rentals and whether the potential movement across the country and even locally within the state to regulate short-term rentals could have an effect on the housing market. Do you think that could free up more inventory to uh, improve housing? Um. Last I checked, and back, this may have come up on your little housing commission thing, but it's only a couple percent of housing uh, is tied up in short-term rentals. And it's, you know, in Missoula, it's not huge compared to, you know, I mean, there's some places where it's big. Um, the, the reality is, is look, demand for place is demand for place. Um, and whether I want to spend a day here, a week here, a month here, six months, a year here, or all of my life here, that demand for place exists, right? And the question is, is how do we allocate the supply to meet that demand? Um, particularly given that, again, with remote work, the ability for somebody to literally, and I, you know, I was at a party recently where somebody was describing that, uh, you know, their son who works for Google, he literally moves every month. He just moves, right? He just goes, finds the next location. Um, and so, you know, that's the demand side. And so the question is, is do we want to accommodate that demand with supply or not? Do we want those people spending time here or not? If we don't, then fine, regulate it. Don't let it happen. Uh, if we're fine with it, then you got to figure out how to build supply to accommodate it because it's just now part of the demand system. Um, and if you don't, the question is, is can you, you know, I mean, and then you move into the second order question of, so I want to regulate it. Let me say, can I? Do any of these regulations actually work, right? Because at least, you know, look, the, the short-term rental 
academic literature is a little all over the place, and I think it might depend a lot on the actual context. But at least in some cases, attempts to regulate short-term rentals, all it did was reduce the supply of housing. Right? So in, in some markets, at least, I have seen papers where uh, when, you went, when, when the move to regulate short-term rentals was imposed, you know, the thing that moved was how many houses you got built because people just didn't build them. Not because you're necessarily building houses directly to be short-term rentals. It's just that there's a ladder and what filters into what places, uh, it just moves depending on how much available housing there is. Hello, uh, our table was discussing the worker shortage in Missoula and around the, the world, but specifically in Missoula. Can you quantify how and where this shortage is occurring in terms of age demographics, full-time, part-time, early retirement? What are the actual numbers that would kind of lead us to why we have such a shortage of workers? I don't know about, do you know anything about Missoula? I know about Montana. Missoula, we it's so we don't get like micro level data for Missoula uh, until like a year from now, um, and even then, the lowest level we get is actually not even just Missoula. It's Missoula, Ravalli, Mineral, Sanders Lake, and Granite County. Uh, so, and I haven't looked at that for this question. So I can tell you know we can talk about Montana, we can talk about the nation, and assume that those apply here. But that yeah, yeah, because on in terms of the. Um there's two things about the worker shortage. Uh, the first is where demand is. So for example, right now, today in Missoula County, uh, there's roughly 30% more people working in the accommodations and food industry than there were before the pandemic, okay? So you wanna talk about shortage? It's, you can see what side it's coming from. Uh, the other thing I would say is that and this is a moving target, and I'm afraid the data in my brain are a little old. But um, in terms of the labor force participation rate, which is the overall fraction of adult people who are either in working or looking for a job, which is a number that's around 65%, give or take, uh, that went down in the recession. It's been slowly coming back. The, the age group that has the most to go before it gets back to where it was pre-pandemic is 55 and older. But that's a moving target and they have been coming back. So that, that may be different now. now. I mean, the last I saw it's, you know, so what we call prime age, so 25 to 54 is basically back, uh, at least nationally, and it's the tail. So less than 25 and ab above 55, that are the laggards. And who is exactly lagging in both of those groups? It seems like I see different studies arguing different things every few weeks. So I won't try and uh, pick one out because I just know that I haven't seen somebody come out and say, this is what it is and we all agree on that. So I was wondering um, with our conversation on earlier infrastructure investment, is inflation such a bad thing in the context of that? Um, like, it seems to me being able to spend a bunch of money now for uh, these investments in housing uh, and just our general infrastructure and then the promise of paying it off cheaper over time seems like a good, seems like it, it, a slightly higher personal cost of personal inflation, like it's a good overall investment. So my question is how is that uh, is am I correct in that assumption or understanding? Um, damn, have we got that order here. I don't know what we're uh, well, yeah, I don't know. You can go. <laughs> so, is is inflation bad? Inflation is never bad if you're borrowing money, right? That's the big fear. That's why we have crypto. People are worried that the U.S. is going to inflate their economy so that when we spend back our when we uh, we, we pay back our national debt with, with cheaper money. However, comma, <laughs> uh, inflation as it truly exists is not just simply between you and, and your lender. It's also in terms of all the construction materials you buy and all that sort of thing. So it's, it's going to inflate the cost of what you're, what you're building. That infrastructure investment will be more expensive as a result. And uh, I was going to say something else profound, and I forgot it. Uh, 
the well, the, the other thing, and the thing that's really, I think, the most clear is that whenever you have inflation that's meaningful, and I would say maybe that's over 2%, you also introduce the uncertainty. So uh, inflation is 8%. Is that a problem? Well, we'll just calibrate everything to 8% inflation. What's the big deal? I'll get my raise, they'll give me an 8% raise, and that'll be just telling me like I got a zero raise. And all my prices will be, you know, that kind of thing. But the reality, of course, is different than that, and that, that now there's a new uncertainty and that you don't know what the value of money is going to be. And whenever there's uncertainty, there's always risk and there's hedging and there's activity that, that limits risk taking when, when you're in that environment. Hi there. Um, we were wondering what sort of industries do you see the Missoula economy supporting in the future? And any thoughts around what we can do as city council, or I guess I should say the city, the county residents, um, what we can do to support that? Well, you're going to certainly have a lot of accommodation. Um, you know, the reality of the shift in location of economic activity is, you know, when you have more people who are working for somebody somewhere else, they're bringing their money here, and what are they buying here? They're buying stuff here. And so, you know, it's obviously good for the people who supply the things that people buy locally, um, whatever that might be. I think the bigger question is, is what do we do here that we sell to people elsewhere? You know, the traded sector. Um, and, you know, that's going to be a harder issue, right? Because that's where the affordability challenges start. They might squeeze it, right? So... Manufacturing has actually done really well recently in Missoula. Manufacturing is usually we make something here, we sell it to someplace, somebody else. The price that I can pay my, my workers, the wages I can pay my workers, is de determined by the price that I can sell my good at in the global market. And if inflation locally for cost of living is higher than uh, what I can raise my prices at, well, I'm starting to squeeze my profit margins, right? I can't, I can't keep paying my workers those wages. And so either I have to figure out how to you know, do something different, or I leave, I move someplace else, or I go out of business. And so that's where the, some of these fights are going to be, right, is how affordable can we keep, how much can we increase supply to keep affordability at a certain level? And then that will determine what industries are viable here. Because if you can, you know, because it's all related, right? You know, if I if I'm a manufacturing firm and I can only pay a wage of this level, but housing prices get to this level, well, I can't. Then I, there's no workers for me, right? And so it's about managing that, and you know, and and figuring out where what we want it here and what we can, you know, allow here. That's all part of that collective supply supply choice that we have to make. Um, and so I can't tell you what exactly those industries are. I can tell you what conditions you can create, and then that determines what industries those are. Um, you know, at the high end, you know, obviously, if you're attracting remote workers, if remote workers really do want to live here, and that's an if, they, they may not. They may change their mind. Um, well, remote work is not uniformly distributed, right? It is heavily concentrated in certain sectors. And the question, I think, is, well, if we get a concentration of enough remote workers, can you then attract firms to say, hey, you don't want to keep working in your basement? Why don't you come work hybrid for me, right? That, I think, is the big question for places like Missoula, is is that going to be a viable strategy? Is there going to be, it's called the job, the people first jobs follow model, right? And it's what we followed in Missoula for a long time. People wanted to live here, so people said, oh, hey. Firms would say, oh, I can get cheap workers there, right? But that cheap worker thing isn't going to be the same anymore. But it's a different form of people first jobs follow. It's like people come here to remote work, and then do firms follow because there's a concentration of talent that they might be able to access for non-fully remote work. Um, so you know it's not a very really specific answer, but you know those are the conditions that you know the two big things. One is what's affordability, what's quality of life, so the attracting of people and the viability of various businesses. And then the the second question is is can you turn being attractive to people who want to work remotely into attracting firms that then you know organize them. Uh, and perhaps provide something that's more viable over the long run.
our question has to do with infrastructure. And as we were talking as at, a, at the table, it's kind of two part. So the first part is we have seen the growth happen across other communities, Boulder, Colorado. What are we doing to look at what they've done to build that infrastructure on a city and county level? And then at the table, I think you were saying there were 5,000? The addition of the th the three to five thousand housing units coming on board in the next this year in the next couple of years, how do you see that impacting Missoula? And because right now in Bozeman, I guess they're they're at a capacity of well, or Bozeman's over. starting to turn. They now have more units available. They have vacancy now because of their building. <sighs> Okay, I'll take a crack at the housing part of that. Um, so the, if we call housing infrastructure, what's the impact of building more supply? Well, that's pretty clear, right? I mean, building more supply is going to be able to accommodate more demand. And in a static world, uh, that should ease price pressure. And that's exactly what a lot of people want uh, for all the reasons that have been discussed uh, this afternoon. Um, the question is... First off, there's two, there's two parts to my question. One is, that all, is all that housing going to come on board uh, given what's happening with interest rates and given what might be happening to the economy? So there's a little bit of a question mark about what's coming on board. Um, but I think one of the things that's more important, though, is to have an appreciation for the scale uh, of, of housing uh, needs versus demand. So we have been in a situation in Missoula, pretty much definitely in Bozeman, where aside from the Great Recession, which is a big aside, because the Great Recession was a big deal. It was a housing price bust. But aside from that, let's call it a four-year period, uh, housing prices have been going up faster than income every single year, all right? And you accumulate that, and of course, the, the big story is what happened right at the end where they just exploded. So I think uh, my answer, not to get too wonky with the numbers, is that it is going to take more than that. What you just described, as strong as that sounds, it is going to take more than that to meaningfully bend that, bend those two curves together, to to have housing growth, um, to have enough housing growth. Just to give you a couple um, tidbits from uh, Bryce's old company, Echo Northwest. Uh, they're 22. Um, update to their housing underbuilding study. What was their number? It was, uh, they said that we underbuilt, nationally we built 3.2 million too few houses in the U.S. 3.2 million. I mean, we're only building 1.4 million total. So uh, you can argue about those numbers, but uh, that would be my response. Following up on infrastructure, uh, we wanted to ask about the comments you made about funding for infrastructure and that we are not currently doing that in a very sustainable way. So two-part question. A, how can we use economic drivers to fund infrastructure? And B, how can we expand our definition of infrastructure to, in to be broader, to include things like mental health instead of just roads? So the first part, you know, I mean, how do you pay for, you, you know, so look, we need to, we expend real resources building, expanding the capacity of uh, whatever we want to call infrastructure. And the question is, is, you know, well, how do we extract the money to pay for it, right? I think what Pat was saying earlier, uh, you know, uh, if I know him uh, well enough, is he wants more markets. Right, you know, for instance, you know, you want you want a new road, let's price the road, right? Let's have people pay for their use of the road, because um, then you know, now I'm in a market, right? I I raise if I lots of people want my road, great, I'll charge more money for it, I'll collect more money, and I can build more road, right? Versus we're just going to have this pool called taxes, and then we'll have some people that fight about it that we elect, and they'll decide what gets built, right? 
um, you know, there's d advantages and disadvantages in terms of who ends up paying those taxes and what who does it fall on. Um, that's why you have different systems. But, you know, and I'm not going to – Pat has more – probably stronger opinions than I do on what's maybe optimal. Um, so then, you know, in terms of how do we expand the definition, you know, the definition of infrastructure, look, I mean, to me, it's all things related to this, this notion of what I'm calling supply, right? The notion that as demand for a place goes up, I need to create all sorts of things, right? That might be a road, that's easy. That might be an expansion to the water system, that's easy, that's, we all understand that. But it's also, I need more trails, and I need more teachers, and firefighters, and police officers, and you know all of the things that go with a larger economy, larger, you know, whether that's more people or just different people, but whatever those changes are, we can, if you want to, you can call that infrastructure. <laughs> um, you know, it's just all the stuff that you need to make the place work, right? And the challenge is, is that, you know, Demand happens, and then there's a bunch of different supplies. And it's not just one, right? It's not like, oh, I just need to build houses. Well, once I build more houses, that means that I have more capacity for people. And once I have more capacity for people, assuming those people are living in those houses, right? Well, I need all the stuff that people need, right? And that's all, you can call that infrastructure if you want. But whatever it is, we have to figure out how to provide it. Uh, and, you know, obviously, if you go, we, we've all been to different places in the world. And how people choose, people choose to do this very differently. Actually, going back to the part of your question that didn't get addressed, like, can we look at other places? Yeah, we can look at other places. The reality, though, is that every place is in some sense very different, right? And, you know, one of my favorite lines I, I use in talks I give frequently is, you know, there's always rankings of place. This is the best place to live or that's the best place to live. Uh, the reality is that the, 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 the spatial economy is governed by what regional economists call spatial equilibrium, right? We all want to live in some place that's awesome, great opportunities, reasonable cost of living, amazing quality of life. But the reality is, is that the movement of people across space equalizes those, right? So we're all just different, right? And the metaphor I frequently use is we're boxes of cereal. Right? You go to the grocery store, there's two big long aisles of, of cereal, there's millions of different kinds of cereal. We have to decide what kind of cereal we want to be, i.e. we want to have to decide what kind of trade-offs we want to make in terms of what infrastructure we make available and what price we charge. You know, How sweet are we and what kind of fiber do we have? All of that kind of stuff. But those are collective choices. right? It, it means we have to get together in rooms like this and actually hash it out. Because what happens too frequently is it we're just on some path and we don't even understand why we're on that path. And so we just end up someplace and we kind of look around and go like, I don't like this anymore. And then we move to someplace else. We go buy a different kind of cereal. But we can try and shape our cereal. Uh, it just takes work. Thank you for coming here today. I appreciate it. Uh, we had a couple questions in our table. Um, one is, what impact do you see the national uh, interstate bill that was just recently passed, that legislation, what impact does it have nationally, and is it possible to break that down statewide and perhaps locally? Hmm. Not being familiar with it, I'll uh, <laughs> pass. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, uh, you know, I, I have not, you know, somebody, I'm, I'm assuming somebody, some think tank is going to produce that report at some point. Uh, it's a big question, right? Because you got to get into the weeds of how is this money going to get allocated? Who's going to get it? What's it going to be used for? Um, so having not done that, um, you know, so if somebody wants to pay Pat to do it, I'm sure he would be willing to do it. Um, don't come ask me because I don't have any time right now. <laughs> um, but no, I don't have an answer to that either. Our table was more concerned with the serial choosers. Um, and there was a, uh, uh, we talked about a generational divide uh, between those who do turn out to meetings like this and to see council meetings. And um, I, I, economists, it seemed to me, do a, a fairly good job of speaking in generalities. But in the specifics of the world, um, how do economists imagine engaging a generation that feels left out and has been really 
uh, disrupted by COVID in terms of initiating their engagement in civic discourse. What are the economists thinking about that? Uh, that's clearly our strong point. <laughs> uh, you know, um, when, you, when you carve up the world, the economists didn't really get that piece. Uh, but I will say that to the extent that disengagement uh, is a result of lack of opportunity, then I do think economics has something to say. Uh, in other words, I think if you could sort of bundle up everything we've said over this whole lunch hour, it's that we're talking about how can we grow smarter, grow faster, grow stronger, and that's the implicit message behind all that is that with growth, whether it's literally growth and making things bigger or making them better, comes opportunity. Um, I, think, I think our profession has a lot to say about that. Uh, but in terms of messaging, motivation, not my strong suit, certainly. I mean, it is a micro decision, right? So, I mean, you know, to the extent that it is a decision, economists have, you know, we have a toolbox, right? We can basically ask the question, well, what, what it's, what's changed, right? Well, you know, why is it that a set, the set, whatever age they are, right? For it, why is it that it's for a set of people, they don't view benefits that justify the cost of participation, right? Is it that the opportunity cost of their time is too high? They've got too many other things to do. Is that the issue? Is it that they don't see the benefits? They don't understand that there are benefits. That they, you know, there aren't benefits. You know, they go to a city council meeting and they view it as boring and pointless, and you know, filled with comments from people who just want to speak and you know all that. I don't know. Um, you know, that's where an economist would come in. We would approach it that way. We would ask, okay, well, let's let's try and understand what the incentive structure here is, because you know, look, these are collective decisions, right? You know, at the end of the day. How many houses get built in our town? That's a policy choice, right? You know, I, as a housing economist, I can tell you, you can make choices that will lead to more housing. Um, they're not popular choices, but they're choices. Uh, but, you know, and so the question is, is, you know, how do you create a system in which, you know, people see the benefits um, and also don't, you know, and, and, and that those benefits are large enough to justify the cost. And, you know, that's a harder challenge and, you know, but that's the simple version. I think this half of the table kind of went rogue here. Uh, perhaps uh, our panel could describe how politics does or does not impact our local economy. I'm talking, I think, at the national level, trickle down. So the current president or any of the last ones, anything that they've said or done, does that have an immediate effect? <laughs> Back door. Uh, sure, so um, one of the things that I do is go around talking about the Montana economy. And uh, the Montana economy is still uh, an energy and resource extraction economy that's been massively affected uh, by this administration. So I think that's exactly what a lot of people want. But, uh, you know, I, I, I compiled, so that's, that's clearly uh, um, a, 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 big, a big deal. Uh, I think, con consider this. I mean, if you, if you put together the federal government, the state, and the local government, we're, we're beyond 40% of a share of the economy that is public sector spending. So how could that not have an impact, right? I mean, when you, when you put all that together. Um, other specific examples, I mean, my gosh, the, um, the whole decarbonization, the whole, I mean, there's, there's just any number of, of issues. Uh, and then there are, the, the, I guess, what I would regard as the softer impacts, which uh, you know, we, we have a fairly large administrative state now in the federal government. I mean, there's a gigantic amount of power in the agencies that administer the laws. And so the kind of people that are in those jobs who are appointed by the president, et cetera. So if that's your question, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a very large impact in growing. And I could 
probably sit here and come up with examples until 5 p.m. That said, and I agree with that. Look, elections matter. Um, that said, I'm not sure how much different Missoula is today than whatever it would have been had you changed every election between 1994 and today. Right? The trajectory, the big macro forces of the economy, I'm not sure how much we've tinkered with those. I might chime in on this one. I'm, I'm certainly not an economist, but um, w one thing that Bryce and I have talked a lot about on our monthly podcast is you know, where you sit has kind of become where you stand. The nationalization of politics and our, how it's wrapped up in our identities now it matters less what is said and what the idea is than, than who said it. So if a president happens to be the one you voted for, or if they say something, you're more likely to think it's a good idea. If it's a president you didn't elect, you're more likely to think it's a bad idea just based on who said it. So that, that's something that when you distill a lot of this national stuff down to the local level, I think um, you know institutions like this, City Club, do a good job at trying to make us think at the local level and less at the national identity level. Great, thank you so much, you guys. That was fantastic. How about we give them a hand? Again, thank you to our sponsors, especially the University of Montana, Blackfoot Communications, and First Security Bank. And of course, thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate it. Before we go, I would like to recognize Brett for his two years of service as our chair for the City Club of Missoula. <laughs> he got us through COVID and then got us back in person, so it's fantastic. Um, our February 13th forum is still a work in progress. Please check our Facebook um, page or website later this week for more information. Have a great month. Thanks again for being here.